Hi, everybody. This is uh, the Cash is Groaning YouTube channel. And of course, this time we're going to be interviewing Rush Baker IV, which is wonderful that he's here. Um, it's in honor of his show yesterday and tomorrow, which opened up on October 14th. And sadly, we'll be closing on November 18th of 2023. Um, Rush Baker IV was born and raised in Washington, D.C. in 1987. Um, he's shown throughout the world and... Um, one of his shows in New York, actually, I remember quite fondly, was at Scaramouche, who's a great friend of ours. And um, more recently at Hemphill uh, Gallery in DC, um, he studied at Cooper and at Yale. He was graduated in 2012. Uh, actually, Yale is kind of a funny connection for us, just because that's where Natalie Westbrook, another artist that I represent and work with, um, that's how we kind of connected. I mean, I'd known your work and seen it, but um, it was kind of through her that um, the depths of the work was was enlightened to me, so to speak. Um, <laughs> which I think is kind of interesting about your work in general is that um, it is something really to see in person. And I, I, I yeah. can't stress that enough. And I have everybody who's in front of it are like, I'm so glad I came, which is you know the best thing to hear, of course. <laughs> That's great. The reason that is, is actually um, partially the, the material that, that we'll be discussing throughout this conversation. So um, I just wanted to kind of walk through the show quickly, just because it, it is, there are some peculiar choices that we made um, that I think are kind of fun to talk about. Um, mainly what we'll see in this little video snippet that we'll go across are um just pull that up oh yeah look at that it's really the rhythm of the show and um as you can see there's basically two two sizes there's a small and then there's a huge and what two couple of things that i wanted to achieve in the show and that you you and i talked about was the ability that you have which is kind of amazing that the energy that you have in the larger paintings that you're able to translate to these smaller paintings and I think that's best viewed um, on our back wall here, and you see it right behind me, um, with Murky Maneuver, which is this piece here. It is 18 by 24, and it's basically settled next to unstable terrain at 72 by 60 inches. It is <laughs> not getting flushed. And that's, that's really a testament to the way you can paint. Um, there's another painting that you have that's an absolute gem, which is uh, Untitled Landscape. It's eight by 10 inches. And I'm just, what's it's these smaller gestures, but again, it's this burst of color that comes out at you. Multiple layers that you kind of swim into, as I like to call them, as you can see here in this little, in the video right now, we can oh, yeah. dive into the image and see these layers that you do. Um, so, but I think it was a pleasant surprise for you as well, because I think, you know, you hadn't seen the space. You just seen pictures. Exactly. Uh, and I think Bart, when I first got to the gallery, I commented on how much bigger the space is in real life. It's like, I had the square footage. I had the schematics for the for, or the floor plan for the, uh, for the gallery. But walking in there, I was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is a lot of space. And it's a big open space. So, it's, you know, it's unforgiving where if you're trying to hide a painting, they all have to, be in conversation with each other, and so I think it was a I think it was a good it was a good thing that the pieces were all made uh, with a certain rhythm in mind, and with them all uh, being in constant dialogue with one another as they were being created. Well, and this is one of the first time where you've you've had a show, right? Where where basically every time you see a work, there's another one in your periphery, yeah. and that's I like that responsibility, you know, of for the work itself to be kind of like having a dialogue, it informs one another. It's not that you don't have rest to focus on one piece, but you just sure. feel like, okay, there's a continuation, there's this depth to them. And yeah. it's for us, it's been a real joy to kind of, I mean, here we go into these details, how each one tells me more about my previous engagement. So it's kind of like, I'm looking and like, Hang on, I saw this somewhere else, and he kind of go back to it. <laughs> and like, oh, there it is. Yeah. Does that work for your work as well in general? I mean, in, I meant more like your working process. 
It does. I think it, I think it ties directly back into my work in process. I think for me, uh, I, I view the smaller pieces as vignettes, and I think they're really directly tied to the lithographic prints that I'm looking at, that I'm using as jumping off points for abstraction. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between those prints and the smaller paintings in terms of scale. You know, it's kind of the size of what, you know, a sketch or a drawing would be. Would be. And then I think about how, like, one, what's working in some of the smaller works, and then how do they become extensions of the things that could be projected larger? And how do they actually act as separate paintings, not just like a a one-to-one -one replica of the same work, but an extension of that work, if that makes sense, a continuation of that that conversation that's happening in the smaller pieces. Can that conversation continue on a bigger scale and function different differently, but still be a, a complement, if you will, uh, to the smaller works? And so I think that's why you see a little bit of that rhythm. I think that they all are of one another. Um, I think oftentimes in my practice, I'll find moments in one painting that I'm just really drawn to, and I'll use that as a jumping off point for another painting. Or you'll see like repetitive moments in some of the drawn elements from one painting to the next. Um, and, and I think about them in series. And so I think those scale shifts are important because I think that they kind of force the viewer to focus in on one moment as opposed to being fully immersed as, as the painting scale up. And I think that's kind of maybe the, the, the difference between the uh, the two sizes and, and, and a testament to the way that I'm actually thinking about building up a painting. It's funny yeah. too, because I want to go back. We were talking about Natalie for a second. And when I was, uh, when I was applying to Yale, uh, she was the student rep that had to interview me. At the time they had, you had to talk to two faculty members and two student members. And so my faculty members were Robert Storer and Peter Holly. And then Natalie was the student, per <laughs> the student person. And I was more nervous about that conversation than I was the faculty one. Because I just well, knew you that. Be. I, in my, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. A tooth, that's a tooth uh, <laughs> that's hard to, to face. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, and so and so I actually, I guess I owe her twice now. Because <laughs> I think she gave me a good <laughs> recommendation to get into grad school and then uh, connect with us and tell and thank her for that. Um, but I was thinking about, you know, Bart, the one thing I really did like about this show, not to get totally off uh, where you might, may have been going, but kind of the collaborative way in which we were thinking about putting the show together, really getting into the space and seeing how the paintings work with them, one another in the space and moving them around and, and trying to get that, that rhythm and that conversation uh, like really balanced out, for lack of a better term. I, I, I enjoyed that process of uh, working with you on that. Well, I think it's also... It especially in your work, because they are such individual pieces, there is no replication. There is not like, I'm gonna work this out in a smaller and then larger it comes like not a duplicate or something like that. Yeah. Um, they live on themselves, they really do, but they do have a thread that kind of comes through it. And I'm, I, I think what's to kind of go back into the conversation, talk about so what we're going to do is talk a little bit more about the materials because then it sure. will lead into the more narrative elements. And I'd like to highlight one of them, um, which is actually the, it was made in 2021. So one of the older pieces in the show, um, it's 14 by 11 and it includes, it's called Untitled Cave and includes um, metal or aluminum, which yeah. at that time you, had been experiments with aluminum and you kind of were um and correct me if i'm wrong but um you were struck by the the way that light was able to be captured so that sure. eye kind of goes in sees um the the glitter or kind of the these the pull in but what's interesting you always push back you know whether it's the metal kind of going boom and then remind you like you're not, it's just a painting. You know, when, when you're diving in, you're kind of like, wow, what's happening here? What's happening there? And it's, I don't want to say 3D illusionistic, but just for, for this conversation where you kind of are like crawling through the painting and you're right. constantly reminding us like, don't get lost. It's still just a painting and you're still just kind of constantly <laughs> pushing us back. But what's interesting is that capture of light, you then figured out a way to do that in, um, especially in this piece, in resin. Right, right. You know, using these layers, using the reflection of resin, where you see a glare, you see yourself reflected in it. Um, 
I mean, not literal reflection, it's not a mirror, but uh, you, you see a presence. And what I also find kind of interesting is when we, uh, because this painting that's actually right behind me, on the of terrain, you know, you first, you're just hit by all the colors and all the shapes. I mean, it's just like, boom, right at you. And then as you kind of go into it, you see all these subtleties, which is kind of funny because you would never think that you'd use the word subtle in work like this, you know, it's <laughs> out there, it's loud, it's present. And then I'm like constantly saying like, no, no, it's really subtle, just look over here. And just, you know. But it is because you kind of dive into, and I do have a quick question about this. I know it's it's resin, of course, and we're looking at these large parts. Did you do them in in layers of resin? So you resin, paint over it, resin, because I don't see that in every one. And there's there's a stack. I mean, and just for the view, just for you guys on who are watching, we're talking. These paintings are are not stacked. They're just they're relatively thin. And so we're talking about um, you know quarter of an inch, if if that. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're usually they're it depends on how many layers I put in. And you know, it's 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 interesting. We were, you know, we were kind of alluded to some of the kind of historic lithographic prints that I often use as jumping off points. And it kind of goes back to my my early education at Cooper Union where I was I thought I was gonna be a printmaker. I spent a lot of time in the printmaking shop thinking about plates and thinking about layering of image and separation of color through plates on in silk screens and even in lithographic processes. And I think I carried some of those layering practices into the way they think about building up the surface of a painting. And they happen in layers, thin layers of resin, but the but then the plaster kind of gets embedded in these different moments in these different layers. And so it, it does give the illusion that you can kind of like swim into the mm -hmm. surfaces. But then the closer you get, you're right, you realize at some point in the painting, you're going to see the grain of the canvas like buried in there somewhere, or you're going to hit literally a metal wall at some point and it's going to reflect back onto you. And so, you know, there's, these, there's this building up, but it, it doesn't get too dense, you know, it's, it's just enough information to get to the point of the painting where it feels finished. And so sometimes that happens in one or two layers, and sometimes it takes three, four or five layers, just depending on the work. Um, and that's kind of like just the way that I think about building up an image in, in, in my process. Um, it's, 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 it's intuitive, you know, there's no real, like, every painting is going to have five layers and then it's done doesn't work like that I think sometimes I'll I'll start a painting and I'm like is it even done before the resin is even needed you know because I, maybe I don't even need to build up the surface mm -hmm. as much um and there were a lot of reasons for how I started choosing the materials that I that I chose um but one of the earlier works uh before this when I was I was the, the paintings in the past primarily in grad school and coming out of grad school were a little bit more not objective in their presentation and I think for me, the materials became so important from a formal standpoint, because I was talking about architectural forms dissolving and then reorganizing into, into new ways. And I was trying to, in a way, embed some political agency back into what had traditionally been like non-objective, hard-edged painting. And this practice kind of evolved into the, the paintings that you see today, but I was using metal as one alluding back to an architectural form that's being distressed in some way. And then two, I was drawn to the reflective qualities of it. So as you're kind of looking at this painting and you're you're observing it, the viewers kind of implicated it when they get a glimpse of themselves. And I think that translated over into the, the resin use uh, when I started incorporating that really as a way to give me a more stable substrate to get a heavier hand with the way that I'm applying the plaster. Um, and so it's interesting when you look at these paintings because there's not that much brushwork that's happening. A lot of this is happening with a palette knife and actual building up of surface with plaster and then kind of augmenting it with heat with different hues and, and pigments and acrylic and acrylic color. And so they're, they're I feel like I always say the paintings are built, <laughs> you know, in a way as opposed to painted. And I think you kind of see that when you see them in person. Uh, you really get that that kind of tactility and that layering and that the kind of the process of constructing the painting uh, is very it's very apparent when you especially when you get closer to them. Yeah, it's I I do have to disagree with you on one point because they do even though you may not have used the brush, they do feel very painterly. 
You know, it's not like <laughs> there is, there is it feel like you're just yeah. chucking some stuff at a canvas. <laughs> I mean, it's it's uh, they very much have a um, a concreteness to them and a and a f not just a flow of the material, but also a flow of of the colors. I mean, Firestorm is a good example of that. When you get sure. into that painting. And of course, it's because of the spray paint and 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 actual brushwork and then resin. You know, we, we can go on and on and on. But what I meant to say is, it's it really is the way a painting is and should be built, which is, you know, especially in the language of abstraction, layers, pull, push, back, forth, um, and knowing when to stop or relinquish. Um, even that element of, of control. I mean, um, I think it's interesting to look at, you mentioned a couple of things. We had a slight glitch, our, our apologies, but anyway, it's, we were speaking about the, the use of material the, um, and a way it af affected and influenced the way you create compositions. Um, we were looking at excavation of a filled monument, which is the large, blue um, painting here and I think that illustrates a lot very well this um, element of paper that is being used um, and the dimensions that you're creating the reaction to architecture that you have um, but I wanted to get, go back a little bit about this um, one of the smaller paintings is shadows of a ray you mentioned you were a printmaker and a lot of this work is um, influenced or, or founds, finds its grounding, narrative grounding on um, prints that you, um, from the Civil, Civil War. And we see here a painting that is slight, where you can see some of those, those details. And what, a couple of things that I find so intriguing about the use of such a literal um, source is a couple of things. The, the resin I, I find, and I just have to explain this, the resin reacts some way with the ink that it literally feels like it's pulling it out. And again, it's that Tompier effect almost, or an idea that it, 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 there's another whole layer and world that's exists around here. So you'll see that in a lot in, in quite a few of the paintings where you just see this kind of warped pulling that's happening. But to um, what I also kind of find interesting is that even though prints are graphic and they're literal, you know, they ex explore something visually, um, and it's not that you're pushing back against it, and and um, but it's more that what I find so intriguing that even though you see elements of, of figures or moments, you kind of are pushing past that and just telling us like, this is not about figuration. This is not about, this is just that sheer narrative that I want to take and I want to start getting that ball rolling. And I guess that leads us into a couple of conversations we've had before, but, um, how you know how do you use abstraction to touch on something that is a extremely important which is um a moment in in, in time of, of american history but also right. definitely of african-american history you know like this this big balloon and at the same time how are you um how are you i guess navigating that through yeah, the, the act of, of painting. That's a good that's a good question. And I, I like this painting because it kind of it pushes back a little bit on my previous statement about the way that I build up the surface of the paintings. Because yeah. there are a lot of kind of painterly from a formal standpoint moments in this painting, a lot of small brush uh accentuations of gestural moves that are happening uh in this painting. And I think it's actually actually like this painting a lot more than I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing it again than, than I thought I did. Um, no, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I I grew up in a, in a political household. I grew up, uh, you know, my, my father was a politician. My mom worked on Capitol Hill. Um, I just grew up in a really politically active environment in a way that I kind of got into art. Uh, originally, was making like anti-war protest uh, posters and things like that in high school. And so, you know, the, the political 
uh, undertones in the work are kind of built into my DNA and the way that I think about the world. And I think it manifests itself in these paintings. Um, a lot of the images that I'm, I'm looking at, I think are important images when you're thinking about where we are today. So even take Shadows of a Ray, the smaller work, I was looking at an old uh, lithographic print from Courier Knives of John Brown's Raider and Harper Sterry from the 1850s. And in that print, it's kind of showing this moment where he's about to get taken down by actually Robert E. Lee, who goes on to secede and, and be a Confederate general in the Civil War. Um, but it's it's the moment before the Civil War, and a lot of people think it's the moment that kind of sparked the Civil War. Um, and so that moment in history is really interesting to me, but I'm not necessarily trying to re-mythologize those figures in any real way. It serves really as a jumping off point for abstraction. And it's 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 that it's that that bearing of the history that I think is kind of important in my practice because then it's a process of trying to figure out what's important and what needs to be revealed. Um, and a lot of times that's a formal concern, uh, but sometimes it is about the narrative. And so it just kind of depends from work to work on what's happening. But I'm not interested in history in any linear sense. I'm interested in like these these moments in time that have through lines. The things that I'm actually concerned with as an artist today, as a citizen, as a person navigating the world today. Um, and so the, the the figurative qualities that are inherent in these lithographic prints in a way are, are ways for me to create an abstract painting. And I view, and I've always viewed, and this could be a little controversial, but I've always viewed abstraction as a tool. You know, I choose abstraction. And I choose abstraction because I think it's a, I think it's a way to slow down the read of a work. I think it's a way to force the viewer to kind of sit with a piece or sit with a, a painting or an object and and it actually be implicated in a way that sometimes I think this pure figurative work doesn't demand of the viewer. I think it's more challenging. I think it's more demanding. And I think that that's that's interesting for me, especially with the content that I'm I'm thinking about and that I'm and that I'm using uh to to build to make these pictures and the, and to build these objects. Well, I think it's okay. that's a long winded way of <laughs> No, 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 no. and it, it gets it right there. I mean, that it's a continuation of what was basically trying being discovered in the 60s to 70s. And that we've spoken about that amongst ourselves a little bit, especially with um, fascination with Jack Whitten. And oh, yeah. uh, we yeah. said something in the um, in our press release, which I think um, is a nice quote, and it really speaks to you, which is beneath every service lies an idea an identity. The amount of depth beneath this surface determines the value of its being. I think it's extremely brave of you and interesting to, I don't want to say attach yourself, but kind of con allow yourself to kind of continue that lineage of taking on abstraction, which is already a, a something tough because it's such a, you know, a language that's already been so well developed. Sure. And pushing your materials into an emotional component, into a theoretical component, into a, you know, a, a thought process. And sure, sure. Just <laughs> along with that, you know, that's a real rewarding journey. And, and um, it's, it was curious. I was like, oh, I was wondering how people are going to react to this as you are tackling some of these subject matters. I'm like, and it was, it, it kind of was self-explanatory almost, which was a big, you know, big relief. No, sometimes you kind of like, okay, this is the intent and I understand it because I know you. And sure, I sure. And you're like, okay, I get it. <laughs> but you're just curious, like, oh, how much do I have to didactically explain here? And be like, oh, look at this, look at that. And you do a little bit, but in general, people feel that there is this, otherness that's there and I yeah that um that allows for them to kind of explore and open and and that delve into um and I just I I find that really um speaks really really highly of, you, of your work it speaks really highly of the show and um yeah it's it's I like I said I keep discovering new things about these paintings and I keep learning so much um yeah. each time i look you know and i know the people pointing things out and like did you see this i'm like oh shit you know <laughs> yeah 
And Jack Wooden was really great at that, having those moments. Uh, Sam Gilliam's another artist that I that, that lives and breathes with me in the studio here. Um, that they're, they're, I mean, they were both very interested in the idea of like this process, this formal process of layering and depth. And then in Jack Wooden's case, he talked a lot about rhythm, you know, not necessarily rhythm in relationship to music or jazz or anything like that, but more kind of the rhythm of the way of building up a painting, building up a surface, and and how each painting needs to kind of have this note that can continue on to the next one. And I think that that's really important in my practice. It's something I think about all the time. It's like, how are these paintings in dialogue with one another, but functioning in different ways that propel, um, you know, a conversation for propel a composition into a different dynamic? Like, how are they reinforcing each other while still being different, you know, and, 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 and carrying different weight a lot of times, uh, different entry and exit points on the plane of the painting. Um, and that's, and it's a challenge and it's a challenge, especially when, when the, when the root layer or the base layer isn't just purely not objective, it's actually rooted in something, you know, that has like historical weight to it. You know, like there's, there is something as you're digging through, <laughs> as you're digging through these things, there's, there is, there is this, this historical weight that's embedded in the paintings and I'm allowing some of that to be seen, uh, by the viewer, which is, which is which is a gamble and it's and it's demanding and it's challenging sometimes but i think it's i think it's important it's important for me as an artist uh when i'm thinking about you know why i'm making paintings why i get up and, and do this every day uh it 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 reinforces uh thematically uh you know kind of the importance of 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 the conversation that we're having right now mm -hmm. and the history of, of black abstraction the history of like kind of the embedded politics involved in these paintings that might even present as not an objective but they aren't they, they, have, they have so much uh political agency uh embedded in them and i think in a lot of ways i think some of the things that you're talking about are, are just me allowing a little bit more of that to be visible uh, yeah. by the by the viewer um than historically maybe our artists felt comfortable even being able to do you know and so and a lot of well, i think it's also you, you you're trusting your own painting you're allowing yourself uh, yeah, to, to exactly. be exposed to allow also an audience to alongside of the, the paintings to figure out that not everything is perfectly figured out you know it's like exactly there is this exactly. ongoing dialogue but what i do find very intriguing and is your ability and i i still haven't figured that out to, um they do feel like series even though they don't necessarily have um literal links to one another you know yes there's the case of the prints that you know when you look at these individually individually they're very out you know they stand on their own yet putting them in a room like this yeah you just feel like yeah these things were made at the same time you can even see that the, the older one that i or older one but they, it, from a little while back and you feel a difference in it so it's kind of intriguing that you you get this energizing sense of and I guess that's the best way to describe it. There's a certain energy you capture at that moment. And even though one is yellow and one's pink and one's like, you know, they're, they're running all over the field. They are done in that same energy. And that is kind of amazing that you're able to translate that to make it feel like this is a conversation and yeah. not just a haphazardness of like, oh, this painting's good, this painting's good, let's stick them together, you know? It's, <laughs> it's, um, yeah. But that, and that I find very intriguing that it isn't an, a, a clear link or a clear thing that I can point to, to say, oh, these are done at, from the same mindset, but it, you just feel it. You just walk in, you go, yeah, I get it. This is it. <laughs> and I do like that you also get this feeling of the conversation's not done. And that right. I really like in these works that I'm like, oh shit, there's more to discover, there's more to go. And that, you know, that also creates, I mean, creates hope, but it creates also this allowance for me to, or me, viewer, uh, to, to kind of go, wow, this, this is already reached and we can go even further. You know, that's that that's refreshing to kind of see that and and that yeah. you would allow that to be on a canvas is it's just great. Well, I appreciate that. And you know, it's it's funny, I always I talk to other artists, I talk to my sister Quincy, who's an artist as well, um, about how, you know, when we're making 
when we're making paintings, these these shifts that happen from painting to painting always feel like these huge drastic decisions or shifts in our minds as artists. But then when you put them up, you see there are a lot more uh, I guess similarities than, than differences. But I do I do really try um, to to give each painting or each work its own individual attention and its own um, they're their own thing. You know, I want them to work with one another. I want them to be in conversation with one another. But they are they're different they're different moments and a similar story. And sometimes they're a different story altogether, but they're all connected uh, you know, with these through lines. And I think these two paintings uh, are two of my favorite paintings that you you've landed on here in the show, uh, the view from Collapsing Cave. And I think this one was a it was by like fireflies. And I think they kind of operate in in two different ways in a lot of in a lot of ways. One is kind of goes back to the cave motif, which is something I've been mining for a long time. And then in Whiz by Like Fireflies, there's a more effervescence feeling that you're getting in this painting. It feels more atmospheric in a way, like you can kind of feel the dissolving quality that's kind of inherent in the way that I was thinking about building up the surface of the painting. And so it's almost for me, they're almost two modes of operation, but they complement each other uh, in, a, in a way that I think goes back to what you were, goes back to what you were saying. Well, it's definitely this this in and out. Um, but um, listen, I, I, I just want to say thank you for your time on this, for you highlighting us a little bit more about this work, have, allowing us to learn a little bit more. Um, they've been a thrill to, to sit amongst and, and look at. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. And people sure. are, are really getting into them. So um, needless to say, if you wanted to learn more, of course, you can talk to us afterwards. But um, I want to say thank you. And uh, We'll be in touch. Thank you, Bart. All right, man. Of course. See you then. <laughs> I appreciate it.